everyone. Uh, this is Chris Helton of the Dorkland blog, and we are coming to you live and direct with the super-powered Dorkland Roundtable, featuring a bevy of uh, game designers who have all have the common thread of having done superhero games. And um, because there's, there's so many of them and they're such luminaries, I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Um, why don't we start uh, with Steve? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Steve Kenson. Uh, I am a staff designer with uh, Green Ravine Publishing. Uh, I did uh, design work on Mutants and Masterminds and uh, DC Ventures. And um, I also did the um, design work for um, Icons, uh, published by Adamant Entertainment. Um, and I've done freelance work on a whole bunch of various superhero games at one point or another. Uh, Josh? Hi, I'm Joshua Coopley. Uh I am publisher and writer for Imperfect Games. Uh, I've written a game called Invulnerable uh, and a source book uh, and a number of things in the works right now. And I've also written on a series of uh, sci-fi adventures for a cult moon. Uh, going to be called the Sci-Fi Toys, currently called the Captain's Logs from the Sandbox. Jeff? Well, we can see you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, Jeff D. I um, uh, co-designed in 1979 a superhero role-playing game called Villains and Vigilantes. There's another edition in 1982. Uh, my co-designer was Jack Herman, my high school buddy. Uh, and just a couple of years ago, we re-released Villains and Vigilantes in a um, version 2.1. Uh, I also, in the meanwhile, did another superhero game called Living Legends. I don't know if people will be as familiar with that one. And I'm known for having worked as a staff artist for Star back in the AD. Chris? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Chris Rutkowski. Uh, I designed uh, Bash, a uh, superhero role playing game. And. Uh, fantasy and sci-fi derivatives thereof, and uh, recently just came out with a new, totally different game uh, called Honor and Intrigue, which is a swashbuckling game, like Pirates and Musketeers and all that kind of stuff. And uh, finally, Cam, who's getting himself nice and comfy. Oh, I'm all over the place. <laughs> um, my name is Cam Banks. I'm a... Uh, the creative director for Margaret Weiss Productions, and I'm also completely uncomfortable, so I'll just move around here. Hand, there you go. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> All right. Excellent. Yeah, we just put out early this year the basic game, which is the first product for the Marvel Heroic Role Playing, and uh, in a couple of weeks we should be seeing the first supplement for that, a big event book for Civil War to be hitting the shelves. And uh, it's huge. It's got about an inch spine. The, the premium version has a really... It's pretty big. So... Um, that's uh, that's my latest book, but the stuff I've worked on before, almost all of it with Margaret Weiss Productions, has been licensed tie-in stuff, and we hadn't done any. We did Smallville, which was a uh, a license based on a TV show about superheroes, but it wasn't quite a superhero role-playing game in that sense. It's more like a relationship drama game. So Marvel was my first real attempt at doing something that was more traditional in that sense. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to start with an, a nice easy question and I'll just take you back through in the order we, we, we did the first time. Um, what's your favorite comic book character? Steve Jensen. Uh, it's always I get that question a lot. Um, you know, it depends on whatever comic book I'm reading you know, at, the, at the moment. Um, I'm a big Green Lantern fan from way back. Um, and um, I'm reading Mark Wade's uh, run on Daredevil now. Um, so right at the moment, I'm a big Daredevil fan because I'm really enjoying his interpretation of the character. Um, but I mean, I like all kinds of, you know, you know from the, the real cosmic, uh, powerful characters to the real street level characters. Um, they're all, they've all got something interesting about them, to one degree or another. I think it's really just, there aren't any interest, uninteresting superheroes, there are only uninteresting creators, as far as tech goes. <laughs> okay, what about you, Josh? It's really hard to choose a favorite also, but I have to say, 
the first one that comes to mind for me is the Silver Surfer. I mean, he's kind of a, a complete package in many ways. There's a little bit of the Silver Age silliness. I mean, he's a surfer, and he flies in space, but he's silver. And yet, at the same time, when you read the comics, it's everything that was great that Marvel brought to the table. There was a lot of drama and a lot of experience at uh, um, and, and a real uh, sci-fi bent to a superhero comic. So, good piece of What What about you, Jeff? Gosh, they, you know, the, my old favorites have changed so much over the years. It's um, I'm hesitant to say I still like them as much as I once did. Uh, I think currently the the book I'm enjoying the most is Invincible. Mm. It's a good book. But of, uh, of the old, you know, standby characters, I guess uh, Spider-Man would be the guy. It's hard to go wrong with Spider-Man, yeah. All right. I like that he's, he's not cosmic. <laughs> Yeah. What about you, Chris? Um, yeah, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have said Spider-Man as well. Uh, Sp- that's what got me into comics and superheroes uh, in the first place. But um, I've gone back and started reading the old Essential Avengers. I've got all, every one that mm-hmm. Marvel has made. And um, so starting from the very first issue, uh, going th- all through the 70s, uh, and stuff. But I probably would have to say Black Panther, at least the, the, in the, the way he was originally, was one, is one of my favorite characters because he uh, doesn't have much in the way of powers, I guess super sense of smell, but other than that, it's really good training. He's, it's like kind of like Captain America, has no powers, but he doesn't have the shield either. He's as smart as Iron Man, can invent things, but it owns the only world supply of vibranium, doesn't need it, goes around and just fights people with his hands and his feet, doesn't use any gadgets or anything. Now, nowadays, I think they make him have vibranium gadgets and stuff all the time, but, but originally, no, he didn't need anything. He could just go out off on his own. All right, what's your answer, Cam? Well, I'm kind of... Oh, and we just lost Jeff. Oops. Sorry, guys. We will now call him the mysterious Jeff D. (laughs) Anyway. I'm sorry, Cam. Go ahead. Oh, it's fine. Just some, you know, (laughs) accidents always happen. No, I was going to say that I cheat, I cheat by not actually liking any specific hero singular. I, I tend to go for team books. Mm-hmm. So Avengers is always one of my favorites. I mean, I used to like Justice League when uh, it didn't really like the, the comics each individual character was in as much as the team book. Mm-hmm. So Legion of Superheroes was always a, a big deal for me because it was just hundreds of characters and you could, could hardly keep track of them all. Uh, so lately, things like um, the different Avengers incarnations have been a real joy to read. I like Brian Bennis's work, and so even when you've got these teams uh, who have some strong personalities in them, I like the cohesion of them all and how they all interact with a arguing all the time or acting like family or, or splitting up and coming back together again. It's, that's my favorite side of it. I think that I wouldn't want to single any one of them out. And we have Jeff's head back. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm just a moderator, but I'll toss mine now. My favorite there has always been uh, the question. There's something about, you know, a person without a face that just is kind of freaky. <laughs> so, for the, the next um, tough question, we will uh, go into gaming stuff, and uh, how did uh, each of you get started in... Oh, and Jeff's already gone mysterious on us. Um, <laughs> I give up. I'll just now. I'll here in my fortress of darkness. <laughs> Somebody needs to do a stat for that now. Um, how did you get started uh, in gaming? Uh, you know, back back in the day when you were starting out as a gamer, what uh, what got you started? Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with Steve. Um, well, I got started in RPGs with the first edition of Gamma World uh, back when I was in grade school. And um, I begged my parents to buy it for me um, from 
a local bookstore, and I spent um, a good portion of my um, summer between seventh and eighth grade rolling up weird mutant characters on the mutation tables and talking my friends to playing it with me uh, and just romping through all of the, the different Gamma World. I think there were there were a grand total of, of two Gamma World modules out there uh, at the time. So we, we played those to death and um, then we decided there was really, you know, after a while nothing more to do in Gamma World so we Dimension warped our Gamma World characters to some D&D adventure and spent our time, you know, going through our mutant powers and our lasers, you know, cutting through D and D monsters and collecting gold pieces for a while. So there's 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 no friend that's as good as uh, the friend that's willing to play a giant bonnie for you. True. <laughs> Josh, how did you get started? Uh, I got started in junior high and uh, I think my first game ever was Palladium's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then Robotech, and then for a long time it was nothing but Phase Rip Advanced Marvel Super Heroes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. And uh, actually, I got uh, Marvel Super Heroes. We moved to a new city, first time I'd ever uh, lived somewhere new. And it was interesting because for the first time across the street was a Triple K, and I could go buy comics. And I introduced a whole bunch of people in this new school to role playing and I ran, I was the judge during uh, lunch and just uh, quickly had uh, a big circle of friends and we were all big into superheroes and comics. It, it was an amazing time. It could have really sucked, but it was awesome. <laughs> Alright, what about you, Jeff? Um, my eldest brother, uh, back when I was in junior high, I think, my eldest brother was in a tabletop miniatures game, uh, weekly gaming group, and he came back uh, one evening telling me about this brand new thing they had discovered called Dungeons and Dragons. So I begged and pleaded that he bring me along to the next uh, meeting, and he did, but of course they didn't play D&D, &D, they played, uh, I think it was Chainmail. And, uh, you know, these older, like, college kids let me take command of this little military unit. And I role-played my heart out as I promptly got all my men killed and ran my, my command figure over to the enemy fortress. But uh, soon we had access to the rules. I, I grew up about a half-hour drive south of Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So we were up there in the dungeon hobby shop pretty regularly. And... Uh, uh, I guess my uh, the first real role playing game that I played was Boot Hill, and I actually ran it for a friend of mine. And we had a scenario on a train where Indians attacked, and there was this moment where a guy with a shotgun missed an Indian standing directly in front of him because of a, a bad roll, and that was my introduction to the importance of game design. Um, <laughs> Villains and Vigilantes uh, came from an argument Jack Thurman and I got into. We were, we were both gaming by that point, but um, there were no superhero RPGs. And, uh, you know, we, we got into an argument who would win in a fight. His favorite character, um, uh, Human Torch, or Spider-Man. So we said, well, we could game it out, I guess. How would we do that? Well, the only... Uh, set of rules that my brother had left me when he went off to college was Empire of the Petal Throne. <laughs> which, which is well known for playing superheroes. Oh my god. <laughs> um, so awesome. I wrote up stats for the two characters and I forget who, who won, but that is what gave us the idea that, hey, there's something here, this might be a thing we could actually do. So that's, that's, very, that's very cool. Uh, Chris? No, right, so um, I got interested when I was in about, I think, 6th or 7th grade. I started reading the D&D Endless Quest books, it, basically the D&D &D version of Choose Your Own Adventure. And from there, uh, my parents decided to get me this for Christmas. I still have it. It's one of my favorite possessions. Chris is all um, about the product placement. It's the, it's the 1991 <laughs> black D&D box set that came with the well, Escape from now. Dancer's Dungeon module inside. 
And, um, yeah, that was probably uh, one of my favorite Christmas gifts of all time. I got Hero Quest at the same, the same year, and never occurred to me to replace the little fold-up paper miniatures with the really cool plastic ones from the Hero Quest until some years later. But, um, yeah, it, it was my introduction to role-playing games. Uh, for the longest time, I only played fantasy. I only played... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and then later uh, Palladium Fantasy for the longest time. Uh, I, with superheroes, I remember there was um, this uh, cards, like these trading cards, like collectible cards mm -hmm. that they made, and I made my first attempt at making my own game was something where you just roll a d20 and add the number that it says on the, co the collectible Marvel cards to make them fight each other. And that was like my first first game design thing that I tried when I was like in seventh or eighth grade. Someone's about to be evacuated. They're coming for us. <laughs> it's not us. <laughs> <laughs> Alright Cam, uh, how did you get started? Did they have gaming in New Zealand? No, they didn't have anything in New Zealand actually. It's a, it's a strange wasteland of nothingness. Actually no, back, back in the, uh, the very early 80s D&D came out at roughly the same time as things like uh, uh, Fighting Fantasy by um, Ian Livingston and C. Jackson. Those, those early games very similar to uh, Endless Quest. And I think Endless Quest, much like Chris said, was my intro. But I had the first three books of that series, and, and that was the only d and I was really allowed to have. And uh, I had a buddy who came over from the States, and he was from Colorado, and he was new and different and cool. And he had brought all this D&D stuff. He had first edition AD&D. He had some um, pre-Elmore Redbox stuff and just all kinds of great things. And he could have had a, mashed it all together and made some game that we played in, in middle school, your equivalent of middle school. And I think uh, we just kept doing stuff like that through uh, early high school and, and so on. And it was probably around 94 or 5, uh, maybe a little earlier than that, that I, I picked up Villains and Vigilantes, and that was the uh, probably one of the first Supers games I played, but we didn't play it with anyone because we couldn't figure out uh, how to convert it into D&D, and that was the biggest mistake we'd done. I made all these characters and all that sort of stuff with the, with the, the math, and, and so at my grandmother's house, I can still remember this, sitting there making about a pile of like 20 or 30 characters, and she came in and said, what is this? Are you doing math homework? I said, this, yes, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing math homework. I was in um, uh, on holiday, and I, I, I was bored out of my brain, and this is maybe a year or two after that, and uh, I didn't have anything to do. I didn't really want to go tourist uh, trapping with my parents and my brother. I'd rather just sit at home in the hotel and, and read. And so one day my parents dragged me into the city center of this town that we were visiting, I went to a bookstore, and I found the Yellow Box uh, Marvel Superheroes games. And I grabbed it immediately and took it with us uh, back to the hotel. And I didn't leave. I kept reading this game. Uh, so I managed to avoid all the annoying New Zealand tourist stuff by reading superhero games. That's the, that's the way I got into that stuff. But, yeah, I think that um, we were very much into whatever was coming up next. You know, we went and bought every single TSI game they had played two sessions and went back to D&D. We bought this thing and played a game of it and went back to D&D. I think the longest campaign I'd ever actually done other than D&D was the Marvel game that went from mid-college, uh, well, high school to you, uh, through my, uh, you know, to college with my friends. So that was, um, that was pretty cool. I think that was the biggest break I think we'd ever had from, from fantasy at the point. Yeah, I think for me that the when the the yellow basic Marvel box set came out was was when I kind of made my my jump from fantasy gaming into something that was that I was actually a lot more interested in because I read comics since when I was like four years old. My parents owned a convenience store and had one of those big metal comic spinner racks, and um, so I was reading comics before I could actually read and. Um, making up really bizarre stories to go along with the Avengers comics that uh, were on the, the comic spinner rack. I miss those things. Those spinner racks were really cool. They should bring those things back. They're hell on the comics, though. 
Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, but we didn't care back then. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't, you know, we if, if we got an issue two and an issue eight, we were happy because we didn't really realize that you were supposed to get all the ones in between, too. <laughs> so the, the next... <coughs> Excuse me. The next question would be, um, how exactly, or or when exactly did you realize that you had transitioned just from being a a gamer person into being a designer? Steve, oh, we well, lost Cam. Um, I guess I I the, the exact moment of transition for me was when I went against all the advice they give you and I quit my day job. Um, you know, I did freelance work uh, for a while. Um, mostly I got my start working freelance on Shadowrun for FASA. Uh, and when I got my first novel contract from FASA, I decided that I would finally quit my hated corporate job uh, and uh, make a go of you know, being a writer for a living, uh, and uh, so I think that's really the point where I transitioned to being a, um, a, you know, a sort of a hobbyist freelancer to you know being a, a, a professional as far as that goes. Because then it was then it was pretty real when it came down to paying my rent and paying my bills and making sure I had enough work. Um, so that's that that made it pretty real. What? Um, <clears throat> Uh, just uh, as sort of a, a, like you know the the people who either are or will be listening. Um, what sort of advice would you give other than you know maybe not quitting your day job, your day uh, job yeah. <laughs> to to somebody you know who's thinking of making that sort of move from being a you know gamer to a designer? Well, I think it's it's important for for would be industry designers to to have a sense of perspective. I guess you know it's it's the idea that you know I, I love to hear people's perspectives of what the inside of the especially the tabletop industry is like um, because they they have to understand that it's a small small cottage industry you know even the big top tier game companies compared to a lot of you know huge mainstream publishing are relatively small. So, you know, it's, it's being aware that you have to have, you know, reasonable expectations as far as those things go. And, you know, I, I don't think anybody in the RPG industry is in it for money. Um, you know, if, if people are earning a living at it, that's terrific. But, you know, everybody in the RPG industry is in it because they love RPGs and they love creating for RPGs. Um, and that's the primary thing. You know, if you want to, if you want to make a living at it, then you, you figure out ways to make it meet. Um, but you know, you don't get into it with the idea that you're going to be, you know, a billionaire. A bill, yeah, wealthy rock star. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the, the old time joke of you know the way you make a small fortune in the game industry is you start with a really large fortune. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, what about you, Josh? When did you uh, make your your transition from gamer to designer, and what what brought it about? Uh, a lot of this is still pretty new to me, since Invulnerable has only been out just a little bit over a year. Um, I think the first time a thought came to me suddenly that wow, I'm a game designer is I started to get a publisher spam in my. Uh, my mailbox. <laughs> you uh, uh, can publish your book, and we have ever designers to work with you. But, wow, so someone wants to make money off of me. They think I have money. That's, that's sad and cute at the same time. <laughs> um, since you know you're well, you and. Uh, uh, Chris, in particular, is the sort of more modern self-publishers. What would you, what would your advice be to someone looking at, you know, making that jump into self-publishing? Um, I find that there's a lot of folks that are asking for advice on 
game design because they would like to design a game with a dream of eventually being a publisher. The thing is, a lot of them have played a game or two. You need to play everything. You need to learn how probability and math works. And more to the point, you have to learn the psychology a little bit of how games work at the table. And I think one of the things I used to say at the Forge is always, always, always play test. Play test, play test. And um, as far as like being in, in making it in business, um, uh, I don't know. I'm not living off of this, and I don't know that it will ever happen. It's really fun. Go into it expecting that this will be a hobby. Most likely this will be a hobby that will pay for your hobby. It may pay for itself, and if it works out, that's wonderful. But like Steve said, you know, it's it's an expensive hobby, and it gets more expensive if you're uh, trying to start a new business. And um, Jeff, how did you make your start, your transition from gamer to designer, other than arguing over uh, <laughs> who was who was stronger? If we're um, if we're talking about uh, being a designer professionally, um, that didn't happen until I got into the computer game industry. Uh, even uh, back in the original v and days, I, I did uh, have a job at TSR and then one at Fantasy Games Unlimited, the, the guys that originally published but I was an artist. Um, eventually, I broke into the computer games business as, as an artist. And, uh, I got into that just before games went 3D. And as one of the unfortunate artists with a strong 2D background, I was not one of the people that got uh, assigned to do the 3D stuff. And I found myself relegated to doing icons. So, um, so I said, well, screw that. I've got this, I've got this skill that I've, uh, I've been using in paper games. And after about five years of trying, I, I, I got I started getting design jobs in retail. Um, now, Jack Herman and I were running Monkey House Games Town. We, we released some of the Lanties. Not a big enough company for us to make a living off of. Um, and for years before that, I'd been running a really small company of mine called Unigames that published one of the games. Uh, my new game. But that's all been hobby. Um, what advice would uh, would uh, you give to uh, the the newer uh, uh, starting out creator, Jeff? Uh, uh, I think I would say must you. Uh, there, <laughs> there is already a lot of stuff on the stands, and it's hard to get noticed, and it's you know, hard to develop a following for your game. That's a, that's a very selfish thing for me to say. So I, I would. But um, uh, I don't know. I, I like what has been said so far about you know, maintaining a reasonable level of expectations and developing you know, understanding of game mechanics and game play psychology and all that. That's that's, that's all great advice. You, I would probably also add uh, watch the contracts that you sign. Uh, yeah. If you're gonna <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, what about you, Chris? When did I, you make your transition? Well, um, like I said, those I had the Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game, and we had these Marvel cards. Like, hey, how do I make these cards work like D and D? Because the cards had the stats and stuff on the back, but there was no game attached to them. So I tried making a game. It was like three sheets of binder paper. And uh, that was when I was bit by the game design bug. I started trying to make my own fantasy RPG shortly after that. Uh, and uh, the but the first time I guess I did it professionally, like where I actually made money off of the thing, was um, with Bash. I uh, kind of took a uh, took a little bit of a risk. Right, and uh, paid for the, I think it was $40 at the time or something, paid for the publisher access to RPGnow.com. 
And so I was able to become a publisher. I bought some stock artwork. And using Microsoft Word, of all things, I made bat the first bash book with Microsoft Word and copying and pasting the artwork in myself. And was, this was all done just by me. And I made the first bash book. It was like, what, 30 some pages, maybe? And it, I was not even expecting to make the 40 bucks back. And when I made the 40 bucks back, I then said, I told my wife about it, you know, because otherwise it would have been, you spent $40 on what? You know? <laughs> so so I, <laughs> I made, made the 40, more than the $40 back, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to make another one. I'm going to make a fantasy bash game now. I'm, then after that, I, I said, okay, I'm going to make a setting book. I'm going to make a, a city for book. And each one get, gets a little bit more professional looking, a little bit more, uh, get, they, they each get better quality after the next. And then uh, Bash Ultimate Edition comes out, and that's I think Bash Ultimate Edition is when I said, all right, this is, I'm actually doing this for real. It's not just a hobby anymore. And um, what's the what's the advice that you would give to the people that are looking to start out as a designer or as a you know self publisher like you are? All right. Well, with, as a self publisher, um, I'd say you, it's really important to try and get those um, get the production value. Right. Like I said, when I first started out. I was cut, cutting and pasting pictures into Microsoft Word documents, and that that you know that's that's great for something that you're going to play with just with your friends. But it, the you know that adage that uh, never judge a book by its cover. Yeah. Game the the audience that purchases the books they've never heard that before. They don't care. They do judge the books by the cover, the interior artwork, and so on. Having a good production value. Is important. It's an investment that will it, that that it, it should return uh, to you. So, like, if you think, "Oh gosh, it's a steep uh, price to pay to have good art," having no art or bad art is even worse because you, you might not sell anything. But the um, I I guess I'd uh, say as advice is. Um, it's it is a hobby. It is like a hobby that pays for itself, but it's you also have to think of it as a business. Um, and in the, in that part, it, it kind of takes money to make money. You have to be able, willing and able to put resources into it as well. And uh, what about you, Cam? When did you uh, make your move from being a gamer to being a designer, Cam? Cam, I feel yeah, like I'm Ferris Bueller all of a sudden. Can can you hear us, Cam? Cam, oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. So, uh, uh, yeah, when did you make your? Open and find us. Can you hear us, Cam? Hang on. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, um, uh Cam is sorting things out. Yeah. I want to add um, that you know, uh, Chris made a great point about production values, especially for um, superhero games. Superhero games are so heavily art superhero because superhero comics are so heavily art based that you know superhero games have to have a really strong visual uh, appeal to them. With, with some RPGs, you can get away with being very art light or getting away with you know uh, you know fantasy game with the pseudo medieval clip art um, sort of thing. But with superhero games, it's really hard to do. People have a certain 
expectation when it comes to superheroes that it's, they're going to be accompanied by this really good art. Do you think that that gives a, a sort of an advantage to the license games where, you know, they have the, the libraries to draw upon? That's, that was certainly good for us when we were doing DC Adventures. You know, one of the good parts about it was you know, we had access to DC's whole art archive you know, that illustrating some uh, stuff. The difficult part for that became that, wow, we've got DC's whole art archive. What do we, where do we start? What do we pick? Um, and yeah. we, uh, for um, the uh, Heroes and Villains books, actually um, crowdsourcing a lot of the um, art ordering uh, in the sense of asking a lot of the fans in our forums, hey, we need to come up with you know iconic illustrations for these characters. What are your absolute favorite images of these guys in the DC Comics? And people pointed us to some really good stuff. Um, you know, I mean, we were able to come up with a lot of it on our own, and there was a tremendous amount of, oh yeah, I want that picture from that issue where that thing happened. <laughs> and, you know, then you've got to try and figure out. You know, because DC wants, you know, page and panel number, you know, um, and so it's like, you know, that one with the thing, and it was about 20 years ago. There was a punch, and he right. went to a window. You know, and so we had to try and find ways to track down some of those pieces of art, um, but we also had, had great um, help from the, the fans in terms of, of pointing out some really terrific um, art resources and ideas for us uh, as far as that went. But yeah, it's, it's very different when you're working with an existing art archive versus commissioning entirely new art uh, for a for So is, uh, from Jeff, from the perspective of, you know, the, the token artist in this uh, discussion, um, uh, I mean, what, what are your thoughts uh, on that, you know, the production and of, of an art end of things for, for a game? Um. I know that's a pretty vague of question. I'm trying to think of something clever that hasn't, you know, to contribute that hasn't already been covered. Um, uh, and, and I can't think of um, Well, I mean, uh, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, so, well, as, as the, the person who's both a designer and the artist of your game, how do you, how do you select you know your art for your for your games and and publisher um, yeah and publisher uh oh boy um i mean since i'm i don't select the art i i i create it so um, in i'll just i'll just tell you an anecdote uh when we did v and v 2.1 we knew that we didn't have very many resources to, to make it with, and we knew we wanted to get it out in a very short time frame. So, uh, and we also knew that we could not come out with something that had less art in it than uh, re the revised V and V from 1982 had. So we literally um, uh, counted up all the illustrations that were in the old book and the sizes, and we recreated that amount, exact amount of art. And then uh, and then came up with new uh, images to put in those spaces. I mean, the layout is all different too, but uh, that's how we did that. Welcome back, Cam. It was it was very you know um, seat of the pants and uh, and making it up as we went. Now, did you actually like try to recreate any of your art, or did you just go with new? Not, not in that. Not in that. We did have a big uh, one thing that that hadn't really ever happened with Villains of Vigilantes before because it was being published by a company that was not us, that was taking in adventures from people who were not us. It, it never really had a coherent setting. It was, you know, every new adventure was essentially a different superhero world. Uh, and we wanted to wanted to emphasize our setting, so we, we put a big emphasis on the new illustrations. Um, uh, highlighting the major characters from our world, which for anybody else, I mean, that's just an obvious thing you would be doing, but for us it was new. Oh, we lost Cam again. Um, <coughs> why don't we um, talk about the what what out there, uh, game wise, other than you know the stuff that you yourself do? Um, are you uh, finding that you know you're playing?
playing with getting you up oh, there I go. You Did you guys hear any of that? <laughs> Am I still here? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Yeah. Figures I'd freeze right in the middle of the question. Um okay. Um now I forgot my question. Um no what <laughs> it sucks getting old. Um now what <coughs> my what my question was was um what games out there obviously other than your own are uh, that uh, you're playing that that are getting you excited and you know you're wanting to play and maybe it's influencing uh what you're doing in your own games too but other than what you have what you're doing what what are you what are you looking at Steve um well I Right now, we're actually we're actually doing a lot of um, playtesting for D and D, um, so that's that's kind of taken up my regular game groups game sessions uh, over the past few months, um, and that's actually been a lot of fun because it's, it's the 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 new um, the fifth edition. But yeah, the the new the new stuff is is very uh, trying to evoke a very old school feel. So I mean, it's been basically, you know, several sessions of, of playing through um, uh, Keep on the Borderlands, uh, essentially. Um, so that's that's been a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, definitely has a lot of that um, sort of unintended consequences effect of, of old-school gaming that I remember from my, you know, misspent youth. Um, I sometimes think that um, that Modern RPG design sometimes has a tendency to to, um, and I'm as, as as guilty of this as anybody um, of uh, tending to over design, uh, oftentimes, and not leave quite as much breathing space um, in the game, either in the rules or in the adventures, for for just weird random stuff to happen. Um, that oftentimes is the most fun part of the game. Uh, it's the stuff that, that isn't necessarily in the rules or in the planning of the adventure that just sort of comes up. Um, and it would be interesting to, to figure out more deliberate ways to create and encourage that. Yeah, but it's sometimes less is more when it comes to rules. Mm -hmm. If you have a rule for everything and a special ability, like everything has to be done because of a special ability, it becomes like a special abilities lists or feats or whatever you want to call them becomes a list of things your character can't do because you don't have all of those things. Yeah, yeah. Or if there if there's a specific rule for how to do it that, that ties the GM's hands uh, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And yeah, I think yeah. that in the old school D&D, &D, uh, and I, I'm getting a lot of that vibe off of 5th edition playtest as well. My group, that's what, that's what we've been doing as well. It's, but it's it's challenging from the design perspective because you know designers again, at least as a designer my natural tendency when confronted with a problem is to try and figure to figure out a way to systemize it and you know, there's this just this natural tendency to say oh yeah well we need a system for that um, and there's always that um, desire on the part of the players especially to get greater and greater clarification of the rules of, you know, well, can this rule be refined? Can this be defined more precisely? Can this, this, all of these corner cases be resolved? You know, what about this hypothetical situation? You know, what if this happened? How would this rule apply in this case? And you get more and more built up on top of how all of the, the basic core mechanic starts. Um, you know all of the sort of you know exceptional special abilities that you know Chris was talking about, um, and yeah, it gets to be it gets to be kind of a lot to deal with. Yeah. Do you think you kind of got away from that when you uh, developed icons? Well, that was one of the reasons I I did do icons was I wanted to kind of experiment with both um, icons came out of a, a desire to do two things primarily. One was um, I wanted to do a, a superhero game that had random character creation in it because, uh, you know, I had a blast rolling up characters and villains and vigilantes and the old original Marvel superheroes games. Um, and 
I found that when I play tested icons, character creation was so much fun for people because they just got these weird random collections of, of powers, and then they had to build a superhero around it that made sense. And that always really brought out a lot of people's creativity. Uh, and they, they would come up with all these interesting offbeat ideas and say, you know, I would never have come up with this character if I just sat down cold with a character sheet and you said, make up a superhero. Let's say one thing. I, I run a, a weekly uh, Swords and Wizardry game here on uh, Google+, and one of the things that one of the, the players in my group recently said was that, because uh, this was his, uh, one of his first times playing you know, a kind of an old school approach to things, and he, he was saying that he found it really interesting that instead of creating the character, um, that the character was sort of emerging during play, Mm -hmm. And he really enjoyed that approach, and that sounds kind of similar to what you know you were just saying with the you know the random things, you, and you get this this weird goofy character, and then you know through play you go, okay, what the hell have I got? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a tendency, you know, and it, it's not necessarily good or bad, but there's a particular style of play uh, or design that's very focused on the idea that you you create your character on a full cloth and that you have a very clear vision of the character you know, right from the beginning, and that you have to have all of the tools in order to define, completely define that character right from the beginning. Um, and instead, a lot of times, you know, the, the character really develops through the process of play, and it's really a lot of what comes out of the game that defines what the character is like, rather than the stuff that you did before gameplay started when you were just building. <laughs> Everyone wave to Cam. Hi, Cam. Are you, are you actually back with us, Cam? I hope so. I had a kernel panic. That's not as good. Ooh, that's wow. Okay, well, uh, we kind of what, went ahead of question. I to say, by the way, I think that somebody has to use that as a supervillain name, because Colonel Panic is awesome. What <laughs> name for a guy who crashes computers? In his, uh, in his dark uh, uh, citadel. Exactly. That's kind of hilarious. I like that. You know, with all the like, out of the thing, right? you know, with all the people going down. <laughs> so, Cam, before before you disappear on us again, I'll, we'll, I'll catch you up and I'll ask you the question of uh, when did you make the transition um, going from a gamer to being a designer? Do you think? Oh, we already lost him. <laughs> I tried. No, he can't hear us. No, he can't. I thought he was just messing with me. a lot. No, uh, I, I blame Colonel. Having, the kernel. you know, any stress. Yeah, Colonel Squall. Yeah, that bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Never promoted him from major panic. <laughs> Pretty powerful motivation. Yeah. Can, can you hear can you hear us, Cam? Um, yeah. No. Yeah, working. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hear you intermittently. So, and it comes in my. Yeah, I think we're about to lose him again. Well. I guess then what we'll do is we'll go to Josh and we'll ask him the the question of what are you playing now that's got you excited and is it having any impact on what you're doing as a designer? Go. Uh, I have been hearing more and more about uh, one of my uh, buddies at Occult Moon, Quinn Conklin, is starting to talk about he's building a lot of versions, D20 fantasy out there, but he's going to be building his version I'm not just saying this because uh, I, I'm working with him and he's a cool guy, although that's a very good idea, but he's he's starting to talk about his game Black Pack Adventures, and um, so, you know, I, I think all of us have this experience where we start off uh, running a fantasy game, D&D. &D. We want to run something big, epic, and serious, and then our players come in, and it just goes to hell, and it ends up hilarious. And one guy wants to play a tree, 
And one guy, that, <laughs> I, I'm in a, a D and D third edition campaign right now. I've got, one guy mm-hmm. played at the end. Savage species gets pulled out, and then he plays uh, an awakened pro sorcerer, and, and that that's a, a style of play that that uh, the wackiness is. Um, that's going to be a really kind of a, a cool, fun, interesting concept to build a game around. I'm really looking forward to. Um, a game design, I, I guess you could say it sounds to me like the paranoia uh, equivalent for a fantasy game. That really sounds like a lot of fun. Not so much the backstabbing, but just the anything goes. Just the superhero systems really lend themselves to that, too. Like, oh, yeah. How many times yeah. have our supers groups made a character that was like, my character is a sentient black hole? Yes. Sure. Exactly. Which is which is what makes superhero I games so awesome. Being. <laughs> superhero games can do things like that because by their very nature they have to be able to do anything. Right. The superhero worlds have magic and science and technology and demons and you know no. clowns that run around the streets with six guns fighting crime, you know, anything. So uh, what what about you, Jeff? What are you playing now that's got you excited and revved well, up? And um, I am I'm currently only playing my own stuff. Uh, the last oh, that's a bad game. answer. I am doing other things. It's it's my group really that yeah they they tend, tend to put their foot down. They're used to do things being done a certain way and. I'm sure you've all encountered that bit of that yourselves. Um, yeah. The last thing, I got really excited about not the current edition of uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, but the previous one, and I went around and collected up a bazillion books and trotted that out, and um, immediately my players rebelled, and I had to convert it to one of my own systems. Um, uh, the uh, well, one thing that I am very excited about, though, is the Empire of the Petal Throne setting. Uh, I know I, I mentioned EPT early on. I, I don't know if any of you guys are into this, but um, that was like the first big game other than D&D that TSR ever published. Yeah. It was written by this guy who was a professor of South Asian languages or something. Right. Um, and it's an, an awesome, 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 and weird and impenetrable setting that decades after first being exposed to it, I've, I've finally gotten to feel like I can kind of handle it. And Professor Barker has just passed away. Right. And um, there's still a dedicated audience of fans of his setting out there, and, it, and um, an organization called the Tecamel Foundation was put together to try to uh, you know, get this thing back on the market. So that, that got me very excited. Yeah, I, I got the recent, um, the PDF that they put out, the, the pre-release version of EPT, the one that was like the unedited before they tried to make it more D&D-like. It's, it's really a fascinating read just because system-wise it's so different from, from you know, the D&D at the time. It used a lot of percentiles, and it just, it was, yeah. and then it was, you know, that setting. Tecamel has always been doubly cursed, you know, first at being just, since it's not medieval fantasy, it's like sort of Babylonian, Aztec in space fantasy. So it's, it's With really a little cone in. And, and, a, and a lot of, you know, the weird languages. Yeah. Alien mm-hmm. creatures and stuff. It's it's hard for a newcomer to get into it. And on top of that, it's had a series of different systems published for it that have all um, been different. Their publishers out of business <laughs> one after the other. Yeah. Uh, and and Professor Barker himself, you know, uh, bless him. He um, he uh, he did not care for mechanics in games. And, you know, the r- way he actually ran it was he'd sit there with a pair of percent dice and you'd tell him what you wanted to do and he would sort of decide how, how likely he wanted that to be and then roll. Mm-hmm. That was the entire system. And that's that's not um, 
you, know, you, don't, you don't really want a person who is not that interested in game design doing game design, which happened yeah. repeatedly for that set of time. No. Yeah, I, th yeah, that it, it it it's a fascinating game, but at the same time, it just you know, it it does it does have a pretty high barrier. Yeah, it, yeah. I I just finished up like a three year long campaign for my own crew using <laughs> the the Tecmo game that I want them to publish that I've written. <laughs> um, <laughs> so see, I'm I'm, I'm trying I'm racking my brains trying to come up with examples of other people's stuff that I. So, uh, what about you, Chris? What uh, what are you doing, well, uh, playing besides your own stuff? Right, the basic, uh, the um, the fifth edition D and D playtest uh, that my group did. Well, what we did that was in, and like uh, Steve said, I think it really evokes that old school feel as I showed you guys before. Basic D and D, that basic D and D box set and the rule cyclopedia. That was my favorite edition of D&D ever. And I think this one, the, the, from the playtest, it seems to come as close to that as anything else has. Uh, so I, I, we, I thought the playtest was pretty successful. Uh, what we did that was interesting, though, is my GM is a huge fan of the Planescape setting, so he somehow moved the Caves of Chaos to the city of Sigil, so it's not as hard as it sounds. Yeah. So instead of <laughs> caves in a wilderness, it's the really rough neighborhood uh, in the city of Sigil. So it's the um, key, it's instead of the keep on the borderlands, it's the keep on Border Street, which is like this uh, <laughs> the, the, this one small police station in a sea of chaos, uh, wow. surrounded by these monsters in the city of Sigil, and we're like the police. In the city of Sigil. Little, little Hill Street Blues, sort of, exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah. keep on the borderlands. Exactly. See. Exactly. So it was, it was very, very weird. <laughs> but fun, very fun. I liked it a lot. See, that's one of the cool thing, things about gamers is, you know, you get handed this, what you know, either a setting or the book or something, and then you look at it and go, that's, that's all well and good, but I wonder what would happen if I did this with it instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. And, I mean, really, and that's probably how a lot of, you know, I would say, you know, speaking as a designer myself, but, you know, that's probably, isn't it, how a lot of your designs started out was going, huh, I've got this, what if I did, you know, this with it, or what if I just ignored that part, or mm -hmm. whatever. As far as stuff that's influenced my design... Though, uh, not in right now, but recently, uh, Barbarians of Lemuria, for sure. I, I was I was developing Honor and Intrigue, the swashbuckling game. I was designing a new game system, a separate standalone system for this. And I abandoned that to ask Simon Washburn if I could license his game system to work with it. Right? So, uh, so Honor and Intrigue uses the Barbarians of Lemuria rules, but, uh, and it was my experience with that system saying, wow, this would be excellent for swashbuckling, that I decided to m take that step uh, with him. Uh, so that definitely had an influence on my design that system. Um, well, I guess what we'll do is we'll uh, wrap things up. We'll make uh, a pass of one last question for each of you. Uh, and then we'll we'll each uh, make a passing uh, jab at Cam for not being able to stay online. Um, <laughs> what uh, what do, what do each of you have uh, coming up uh, next that well that you can at least talk about? So go ahead, Steve. Uh, let's see. Because um, I know a lot of places you you can't talk just yet, but you know yeah, what's the next. Uh, they, we've got the ongoing uh, Power Profile series um, going on for Mutants and Masterminds, um, and that's that's been a weekly um, PDF release uh, looking at a different area of superpowers for the game, and that's been a really fun project to work on. Um, sometimes it's a little like laying down track in front of the train while it's still moving, but um, it's it's been good, um, and we've got more releases working on along in that. Um, we just finished up um, getting the um, material for Emerald City 
um, to into production, um, which is the the sort of West Coast sister city uh, to Freedom City in the, the greater Greenpeace Masterminds um, setting that we've been working with since third edition. So I'm really looking forward to having a lot of the ideas that we've been talking about with that for quite some time, finally out in print and out in front of people to play around with. Um, so that's that's the big things. There's a bunch of various irons in the fire, but you know, those are... Is, is the, um, the power profiles, are, they, are those going to eventually come out in a book like the uh, threat r reports? Yeah, yeah, we'll probably do a, a collection probably early next year uh, when the whole series is wrapped up. Um, you know, with, if we go you know, out to the, the planned length of it, it'll make a pretty sized book. It'll probably be about the size of a clearest handbook all said and done, so it'll be a pretty good size book. What about you, Josh? Uh, I've got a couple of things going on. First off, I've been talking to Angus Abramson at Chronicle City about uh, getting a vulnerable in print. That I'm really excited about. will probably lead to another edition, uh, hopefully um, shinier and uh, more internal artwork and uh, not just my uh, uh, foolish scribblings, but um, I've also been developing uh, a couple of other things. I like to do a lot of real public, uh, I'll publish things on Google Docs and Squid and then get uh, feedback on them and uh, update people up there. I've been working on a sci-fi game called Broken Symmetry. It's very, um, bring it in at one genre, weekly based opera on a starship. And um, also a kung fu game for the Viva. Something possessed me, and I don't know why, and I'm doing entirely different systems for each game, and at times I want to pull out what remains in my hair, but it's really <laughs> fun. And each one has a, a, a different underlying philosophy behind the task resolution system, damage everything building up from, from the start. It's an exercise. I like that. What about you, Jeff? What do you have uh, that's upcoming um, from your dark well, citadel? <laughs> <laughs> you can't see it. Uh, Monkey House Games, uh, we've announced that we are working on a third iteration of the uh, Villains of Vigilantes game system, but there's no release date for that yet. Uh, also, we've got adventures um, piling up that have no release date, and that's all because of uh, legal issues that we're working oh. on. Um, I've loved the adventures that you guys have put out so far, by the way. You've, thank you've you put out some... I Actually, I just... I had the PDF. I just picked up um, the the print version of, of the new VNV when I was out in uh, Las Vegas in uh, February. So. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, from Unigames, we have um, a, a Pathfinder conversion of our Quicksilver fantasy setting coming out. Quick, Quicksilver is sort of a um, uh, science fiction-based um, fantasy game. That is to say, all the magic is in fact psionic, and, um, and it's all like justified scientifically, but it doesn't it doesn't look like science. Um, Ooh, anyway, that sounds kinda cool. Take a look at Ken, that. kinda dare and I. The uh, I hope I said the, that right. The um de, oh dare de, 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 de is what I was mm -hmm. talking about the de, de, de. Yeah. Um, uh, the the premise of Quicksilver is there's this magical material that fell from the sky ages past to that uh, if you uh, pick up a lump of it and you're psychic, you can think at it and make it take on any shape you want. And then if you have the correct skills, you can take your psychic power and put it in this thing to give it magic abilities. So it's essentially a universal modeling medium. Ooh, um, that's coming that up sounds cool. Soon. Uh, also, we just recently released Cave Master, which is the role-playing game that cavemen played. It's... Uh, <laughs> We, we claim that it is an archaeological reconstruction of the <laughs> roles of the uh, originally invented by Homo habilis a million years ago, but of course that's bullshit. Um, and uh, <laughs> basically the, the mechanic involves uh, your character skin on the table in front of you and, um, and uh, uh, little piles of rocks that represent your different abilities. And you pick up the rocks. That's awesome. And, 
a little comparison to see if he succeeds. Um, we have adventures coming up for that. Uh, and finally, I mentioned before, I've got a Hackamall game that I built using uh, our pocket users, what we used for the original version of Quicksilver. Um, that uh, I have a foundation about that. We've got a verbal agreement for us to publish this, uh, uh, but no contract. That sounds very cool. <laughs> and uh, Chris, what yeah. have you got coming up? This All right. Well, this summer we've got um, Crook Book. Uh, Crook Book number one came out, and we're going to look at uh, doing. M making this into a series with more bad guys for uh, Bash uh, and more Cavalcade characters. Cavalcade is characters that fans uh, submitted uh, to uh, to make that have their own characters put into a, a thing. But um, also this summer we're looking at Bash Fantasy Legends of Steel, which is a updated version of Bash Fantasy. So it's like a it's like a new edition of the Bash Fantasy rules. It, this one was not is not going to be made in Microsoft Word. Uh, oh come on, that, that's a jib. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually hired someone <laughs> to lay it out, and um, the, you sold out. Yeah, I, I did. And, <laughs> but this is a uh, sword and sorcery setting uh, by Jeff Mejia. That uh, it's, it's Bash Fantasy, but it's specifically this sword and sorcery world. And as far as the Bash superheroes stuff that's coming out soon, we've got a product line called Zeros. Right? You you know the Avengers, the Earth's Mightiest Heroes. They're the best. Now let's it's time for the rest. Right? So this is going to be a kind of an homage or tribute to the Legion of Substitute Heroes, Venture Brothers, the Mystery Men, all the movies and books and stuff about the haphazard. Le like less than superheroes City's over the years. Say that yeah. again. City's fifth best hero team. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. The city's the city's be fifth best hero team. Our, I have to say, our our but, old Marvel yeah. game in college, the, the, we called the heroes the world's most convenient superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> Great Lakes Avengers. Yeah. yeah. It was Avengers. convenient. Everyone else was out of town, so they had to take care of this stuff. <laughs> If you guys yeah. have not seen a uh, a superhero film called The Specials, I highly oh the specials oh yes awesome, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. so I was, um, the I was hoping to pester Cam and find out when Next Wave Agents of Hate for Marvel was coming out, but I can't. Yeah, well, I I guess I'm gonna have look. We'll oh, go, go ahead one. and finish. Yeah, Sorry, so the big thing is awesome powers. I've been talking about this for years. Now it's actually on the horizon. Uh, we've got we're doing uh, editing right now, and what this is is this is a collection. Uh, Bash is a, a game system that uses a point buy mechanic for building powers. So, in the at its core, a fireball, unbreakable claws, and uh, eye beams and stuff. Those are all the same power called special attack. Some people want specific pre-made powers uh, that are all predefined. So that's what this is. This is going to be a collection of powers built around different themes, uh, and these themes are called power suites. So the first collection is going to be of all elemental stuff, earth, fire, wind, water, electricity, uh, and uh, ice, right? and powers that fit these different themes. Uh, and all with all kinds of new different uh, and different uses uh, for them, as well as new enhancements, limitations, and so on. So, uh, this is one that I've been looking forward to getting finally done, and it looks like it's about to happen. So, yeah. well, cool. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for for taking part in this and uh, giving me an hour of your time. Hopefully. Um, I'll be able to get Cam to come back sometime and talk when hit, when Colonel Panic isn't attacking him. Right. <laughs> but uh, yes, thank thank you all very much for taking part in, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone enjoyed the uh, conversation. Thanks a lot. Right. Very Good awesome. Night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. -bye. I'm I'm waving goodbye.